welcome to the February 25th Hadley School Committee meeting. Um, can I get a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Here we go. Um, I know of one adjustment to the agenda that is item 3K, which is the EEC request for census information. We will not be covering that at this meeting. Um, so that is tabled for potentially a future meeting. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? No. Okay. And we will um, be going into executive session at the end of tonight's cool. meeting. All right. Hello. All right. We will move on to number three, presentations and discussion items. The service field trip. Senora. Yes. Update. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I know I'm, I'm like a bad penny. I keep showing up for the same story repeatedly and I don't go anywhere. Um, so I, uh, our plan that was, was uh, to go to Guatemala and um, unfortunately um, we, we switched all of us didn't come from one country to the other because of safety reasons and it, so this has been a long process but I finally have found a company but that's going to actually force me into next year. Um, I had a deposit um, I, from, for that last trip, and they're sticking with me, and I know that you know a few other people would still be sticking with me too. So I don't think it would be a huge trip, but I'd still like to go to Costa Rica um, with a company called Explorica next, next to February, February of 2020. Okay, and this week, Costa Rica? Is the new destination? It is, yes. And the new dates are? It will be the February vacation of 2020. Okay. Um, and the, the difficulty was finding the service component. That is what me, means most to me. And um, so I did a lot of searching, and then I finally found a company that does kind of offer that that service component. Great. Yeah, I appreciated all the information too that was in the packet. Oh, good. Um, any questions from folks? Paul, well, did you hear that? Okay. Yeah, I did. It sounds good to me. Yeah. Costa Rica. There's a nice picture for you. <laughs> yes. yeah. You mentioned um, I'll let go. the concern. Okay, that come on. You, when you come back, you come. <laughs> yes. You mentioned the concern about the deposit. Uh, is it a transferable deposit from one? Yes. I another? what I had done when we had done our trip to Nicaragua, we kind of ran the whole thing ourselves. So the we had some difficulty finding the service. Um, a service trip so I had already started collecting the money with the hopes of it and I gave that already back to them and they have redeposited with Explorica so as of now I any money that I have collected for Nicaragua and or Guatemala is now um, back to the right the right owners so we do have this as an action item um, just because now it is a, a new destination and new dates just to get that permission on the books. Are there any questions before we get a motion? Okay. Motion, motion to approve the Costa Rica trip. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Trip Aye. approved. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, Second uh, item, the music field trip. This is really an informational item on the, uh, the difference in the dates. So you originally voted and approved as presented for dates 27th and 28th. It's actually April 26th and 27th. Based on the language of the vote, I don't think you need to re-vote it. I just wanted you to know about the change in dates. Great, thank you. All right, uh, item C, Hopkins Program of Study. Sure, there's a um, summary document that you have uh, which should correspond to the page numbers of each of the sections in the track changes. Uh, I highlighted any new course descriptions that have been proposed by departments, uh, including the addition of a war literature course, uh, which would be co-taught uh, potentially by the English and Social Studies Department, as well as the addition of advanced placement uh, macroeconomics to be added in to the program of studies next year. Um, and those are outlined by department in terms of those courses as you go through. There are um, items such as the add drop deadline at the beginning, which is just changed to the first Friday of September. Brian, can I ask you a big favor? Do you mind presenting from over nope. here? So it might be easier for Paul. Sure. Here. I'm waving it from Paul. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that the um, 
The ad drop deadline is always the first Friday before October 1st. So the, the, the last day that we can get to in September prior to October 1st, we always make it a Friday. <clears throat> so the students have an opportunity to go through a couple cycles with our um, waterfall schedule uh, to be able to make decisions as to whether or not they're going to um, need to make a, a change in a particular course or section. And then the table of contents that you see is not accurate to the track changes version. I, I changed that to reflect the actual final version that it will be. So um, if you don't pay attention to those numbers, you'll be fine. <laughs> there, is, uh, there are two items also of, of uh, substance in here. One coming at the end, which you don't find on your um, summary of changes, which is the addition of a course called Global Studies. And this is a course that's a one credit option. It's very similar to a course that uh, had been proposed when I was the principal at Mohawk by the social study, I'm sorry, the um, science department chair, Kathy Steer, ran a course called Tropical Ecology of Belize. Um, this is a course called Global Studies, which will, you can see in the course description that students would need to opt in who would be traveling on the Europe trip next year. <clears throat> um, and if they complete the uh, proposed and assigned work to the satisfaction of the sponsors of the trip, then they would receive a one credit travel option, uh, a one credit for international travel, uh, complete with a grade that wouldn't go into their GPA but would appear in their transcript. Nice. Um, and then the other item of substance is very early on, and something that the committee will need to take into consideration. I think Dr. McKenzie has given you guys some information uh, to consider as well. Social Studies Department has been working very hard vertically. Um, I know also down at the elementary school to change the uh, scope and sequence of um, the history and social studies curriculum to align with the, the, the new frameworks. And within that, that um, there are major course changes in terms of curriculum that needs to be written and is currently being written by the Social Studies Department as, as part of Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, as part of their professional learning community, mm -hmm. for example, seventh grade world history is uh, seventh grade geography is going to become world civilization and geography, and eighth grade world history is going to change be changed to United States and Massachusetts government and civics course, which is actually many years ago something similar to what the course initially was uh, under the Massachusetts frameworks they had taught. It was actually U.S. History One, um, but there's much more of an emphasis on civics throughout, in particular, the high school curriculum, but really beginning in the eighth grade. Uh, as a result of that, um, Mr. Burns has, has made a proposal that is highlighted in here with an asterisk on page four. If you look at the note in the track changes version, it says that beginning with the class 2024, which is the current seventh grade, his recommendation is that the committee consider changing the graduation requirement for history to a four-year graduation requirement or four-course graduation requirement. And that proposal specifically, uh, what courses that would entail to U.S. history um, and to world history courses are can be done in some conjunction with advanced placement courses and honors level courses and so forth to meet that requirement. Um, but that's something that we would have time to consider. And so there are a couple of different options that perhaps the committee may have. And Dr. McKenzie, if this is a point where you might want to chime in about, did you share with them what you had I did. Okay. And so on this vote, as you're looking through the program studies, I think I, in the memo to you today on Google Drive, Sent in the school committee can always vote and discuss things however you would like. But the way that I see it is you can certainly approve the entire program of studies with the recommendation for the change in graduation requirement tonight. You can approve the program of studies and request any further information from me regarding changing the graduation requirement, or you can do whatever you want. So I can wait until we're done with the program of studies, walk you through it, and then we can go through the change in graduation requirement that works for folks. You can finish with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's nothing else in, that's not here in specifically in um, the descriptions other than to add in each of the departments was sensitive also to some research that is on here that was done, if I'm not mistaken, by some students uh, 
through Mr. Burns mm -hmm. in, in looking at a couple of schools in our area which are larger. And of course, we had changed our schedule away from students carrying eight courses to carry seven courses, and we added more time on learning to each of the individual courses. And while that has had a positive impact on uh, high school courses, um, it's had a negative impact on the options for electives because students are carrying one less course. In addition to that is a very small school and competing with schools like Amherst and, and Northampton, the elective options that we have, um, you'll see, are, are very small if we don't include virtual high school and some of the independent study options that, that kids have. But in, in terms of looking at our program of studies versus those schools, um, some of these departments, some of the departments have proposed some, some really interesting electives, including the addition of the middle school creative writing and drama option, which would fall into that alternating day uh, course. Um, the addition in science of a forensic science course and uh, anticipating that we will be looking um, potentially at a new science department member or two for next year. They wanted to hold off to see what kind of expertise we might get to propose another semester long um, option for a science elective so that we could expand along the lines of um, what Mr. Saluzio has done with Honors Biomedical <coughs> Science. Um, and mathematics has also added in uh, an additional fundamentals of logical reasoning course which would be available to any student who has completed algebra. Uh, and it's just, it is a course that she has run uh, in the past although before the age of uh, technology, she's found a pretty substantial number of resources which make it much more hands-on and accessible um, for students of all uh, different types of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So one question for you about the, the asterisk statement on the social studies, um, where you've got the parenthetical about 10 credits in U.S. history and 10 credits in world history. Does it need to be so specific as, the, I mean, we're going from it was 10 and 5, is that right? And then, so we're adding this other course, but requiring that as part of the graduation door. Is there any flexibility on that other five That's points? That's the recommendation uh, within the department. If, if for some reason the school committee wished to place something in the program of studies which gave sign-off rights, for example, uh, to give an example, I have the authority as the principal if a student is going to be taking, wants to take AP Biology, mm -hmm. but that's where their physical education course fails, obviously it, it, it would be illogical to force a student to take physical education and, uh, you know, potentially do damage to their transcript by not allowing them to take a more competitive course. And so if there were other options, um, you know, I would think that would be up to the school committee to put that into the hands of the principal and department chair. I will say that the, I believe one of the reasons that Mr. Burns suggested this is when you look at what area schools offer. So Mass Core, the Mass Common Core for graduation requirements recommend a minimum of three years of history. Mm -hmm. And they recommend that high school students have U.S. history and world history. Mm -hmm. That aligns with the frameworks. What Mr. Burns is proposing is in ninth grade that U.S. one course or honors or any AP alternative that that time period covers the revolution through World War I. World history covers civilizations from 500 to 1800, including spread of major religions and philosophies. US II then picks up the 1920s to the present. World history II covers the interaction of world civilizations between 1800 and the present. So the topics, the subject, world and US, is required in the framework. I think that something history teachers often feel is that there's so much mm -hmm. right, to cover it in, in any meaningful way requires more time. Mm -hmm. I will say, so I did share with you and gave you a hard copy in a Google document. I assumed these would be questions you'd be interested in when considering changing the graduation requirement. Uh, what is the mass core, which is mm -hmm. three years of um, history minimum? Right. Uh, what are area schools doing? You'll see that all area schools currently have a three-year graduation requirement for history, except for where, where public schools currently has a two-year graduation requirement for history. We're proposing um, a four-year. Right. Uh, what are the financial implications? Later, Jason, I invited him to edit this document, so I will read what his thoughts are on that. And then what Mr. Beckett just referred to, this course offerings table was a research that a student did uh, with Mr. Burns' assistance. And the student, really the question they were answering was, 
for a small school district, when we look at places where students sometimes consider choice into, what is it about that? How do, their, how do our offerings compare? And certainly you can see in art and music, um, we don't have as many offerings there, although um, we proposed to a theater arts elective, a drama and creative writing elective, and a fine arts elective is proposed in the new program of study, so that speaks directly to that. In social studies currently, we actually do offer, although we don't require for four years, more social studies courses than both of our neighbors to the east and west. So how would it work, we're just looking at the grid um, that shows how mm -hmm. many ninth through 12th mm -hmm. with that addition in 12th grade of the World yeah. History 2, I think mm -hmm. that's the new piece. So 10th grade, um, folks that are in AP US history. So mm -hmm. is that kind of seen as a continuous, is that history too, US history too? Well, the interesting part thing is for students who would complete AP either, if they completed AP US, they actually cover both time frames. Okay. And so they effectively meet the graduation requirement, although not for the, for the courses, they meet the graduation re requirement for the time period, which would mean they would need to take an elective um, so for those students, they would actually need the option of taking the elective, which is fine, but they meet the time period requirement. And I think that's in parentheses next to the asterisks down um, below on the track changes version. It should say, you know, two, two courses worth of uh, U.S. history, two courses worth of world history. Um, and, and part of their argument um, was basically... Yeah, two, two, ten in yep. U.S. history and ten in world history. So it's yep. so two courses, or five credit courses. Oh, okay. yeah. So I guess in, in that kind of situation, are you saying that the elective then would count towards the U.S. history yes. credit? Yes. Yeah. Because they took right. the AP, they're done with U.S. history. Exactly. And okay. then uh, it, uh, AP world history is the same thing. It's basically the, the history of the world from the beginning of time. Yeah. Sort of like the Mel Brooks movie, <laughs> although that was only part one. Right. <laughs> And I will, uh, if it's all right, I will read some of Jason's comments. I did invite him to, com to comment as to why the teachers feel so strongly about this. By adopting, and you notice that I had written that we haven't done a thorough financial analysis, but Jason did weigh in and he was thoughtful about it. He writes, by adopting a four-year program, we believe that we will be best equipped to serve our students' needs. We believe that having a solid social studies foundation prepares students to be better citizens, which is the focus of the new social studies frameworks. We reviewed the possibility of maintaining a three-year program, but this would require combining either all of U.S. history or all of world history into one course, which we believe would not only lead to a lack of depth and understanding of history, but also continue to send the message that social studies is a second-class area of study, as the emphasis has been on STEM for so long. In addition, the social studies frameworks are designed to both supplement and support the ELA standards, so by requiring four years of social studies, we will be able to consistently support ELA learning. The new framework stressed the importance of civics in all social studies courses, and we are now required to do civic-based service learning projects in both middle school and high school. As preparing students to be active citizens is a primary function of social studies education, great, my computer froze, hold that thought, you're on the edge of your seat. We believe that it is important for students to be consistently engaged with it throughout their entire six years at Hopkins Academy. Financially, we do not believe this will present any financial cost. As a department, we are moving away from costly textbooks as the cost for a classroom set of textbooks ranges uh, around $6,000. In addition, there are plenty of free resources available to us. In terms of staffing, we have enough staffing currently to implement this change and actually expand our offerings. With this plan, we will be able to offer an AP history course to the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades on an annual basis, where, as we currently only offer two. Those were Jason's comments. So I guess, I guess my only comment, again, is on this parenthetical statement that it, it could be misinterpreted to only be, I mean, you described the situation of you satisfied your 10 credits already through, um, or you satisfied your five credits in all of US history, your other five could be an elective. So I, you just may want to, want to make reference to Yeah, and I think a combination. I, I, there's not a single student who will be taking a course next year that will have who will register for a course from this particular program of studies, who will have uh, any courses that will have an implication on that change in graduation requirements because it's this year's seventh grade will be in the eighth grade next year, not taking high school courses yet. Right. So 
Uh, that provides us the opportunity for the Social Studies Department to come back with a recommendation that uh, clarifies. Um, and the, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the original draft language that he had given me was APUS or US 1 and 2. AP yeah. World yeah. or, or World the History one. 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, and if it, so there'll be a set of there would be a set of options that would go with that. Okay. Um, I have a question based <coughs> on um, the other district in the area, districts in the area's graduation requirements. Yep. Knowing that we're actively trying to bring in school choice students um, and recruit and recruit students, um, I'm wondering if that would be if, if that would kind of impact that recruitment um, in any way, saying that we require three years or four years of social studies, whereas other schools in the, in the area require three. Mm -hmm. Don't, I mean, I'm all, I'm all for it, but I'm just curious, remembering how I was in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will, I, I will add, you know, we, we have managed to get in now, I think our second school choice student by opening up um, really accelerated graduation options in conjunction with families that may be interested in um, going through the community college pathway and taking a great deal of responsibility and working with our guidance department. Angie Cullinan, as our director of guidance, has done a phenomenal job of um, helping a couple of students where other schools have denied students um, access. Uh, that we, We've opened up those opportunities to students um, and had some students come in from other school districts. And so I think that's an important consideration. I, I mean, I, start, I hadn't thought about that point until you raised it. I'd say I'm curious if other, what other committee members think about. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that, it, that it would have the unintended consequence of um, discouraging that heaven across my mind. I'd probably spin it. <laughs> you know, I'd probably try to spin it as to how, you know, either more AP offerings are available because of this or, you know, somehow showing that it's how it's going to benefit the student. Well, the study it, of history it's, is it'll benefit the students the that can take the AP courses. It won't benefit the students that it can't take the AP courses. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a detriment to those students. Or, or it could be yeah, well, a detriment to the I think students. they're going to get a, I, the idea behind the curriculum that they're developing, and, and basically the, the focus of the curriculum they're developing is to have four years of sound citizenship preparation through high school with hands-on opportunities. So while that's saleable in and of itself, I understand what you're saying, that it, you know, somebody might look to go to where where they only have to meet two years of a history requirement and then they can take other other options. And mm -hmm. so it is something that we didn't really take into consideration. I think it's a good question. I, I, reading the news lately, the emphasis on history and um, just having a historical context, today's day and age, Americans are known for having amnesia and <laughs> not really understanding, um, understanding uh, US history, let alone world history, mm -hmm. where, you know, <coughs> of today's actions based, um, based on past, uh, past actions. I think it's so important. I think it's really, really important. And I, I would rather the students who come in valuing that. And I, I fully, I, I agree with you, and I fully understand that. But it's just, I don't see how these conversations can be held independently of each other. It's like we're trying to do all these things to recruit students but meanwhile, we're doing something that might deter some students. They're, they're, they're those questions, I don't, I think that's just, that requires some additional thought and maybe some investigation into if things, if, if other if districts in the area have changed any of the requirements, if that had any impact on anything like that. Um, it could just be me worrying for no good reason, um, but I'm just, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. And I think that one of the things to add to that um, thinking too is that keeping the positive side, regardless of what the committee decides at this point, we still have time. Um, that it, you know, it's not going to be integrated for a single student until the following school year, uh, anyways, and that would just be at the, at the point of the registration process. But the intent of the social studies department is is worthwhile and um, something, regardless of how it's woven into particular graduation requirements that are selected, very similar to the idea of running um, or adopting personal finance as a graduation requirement. They're trying to put our school at the forefront of an entire program of studies that literally takes a student through a level of preparation 
Um, that's a holistic preparation for being able to go out into the world and not just be accomplished but make contributions. And I love the idea of that, how that manifests itself into coursework. Um, they have an idea that right now they're proposing as being a, a, a four-year idea. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not something that, that can't be revisited uh, with you know part of that criteria being well, how does this fit into our, our process of recruiting people out there as we're an excellent school. Right. So I think I'd rather, I'd rather be selected for our excellence in that, right? I, I mean, you're, you're going to have a spectrum of people who are looking for different things and in their education and they can school choice just about anywhere. But I'd rather get the students that really value that four year history experience. And I think it's, um, I think it sells today to colleges looking at students who can think critically and understand history and can articulate why a certain course of action is important, can demonstrate the service learning components. So I, I would be in favor of it. And can I clarify one thing that might be helpful? Some folks may not realize this. I know you're not speaking to a single population, but if people were wondering, well, what if a student really has challenges accessing the general curriculum and that a four-year graduation requirement would make it near impossible to graduate? If a student has an individualized education program, there may be exceptions made to graduation requirements at any time. So that certainly doesn't speak to every child in the school, but it's important to point that out for people. Okay. How does that, just, how does this impact some of the other electives? If we make this a four-year requirement, how would it impact some of the other electives that we're proposing here for like the science department and the math department? Would they still have equal availability to be able to take these elective courses with the additional requirements? By the time students, a typical student gets to their senior year, um, there is a portion of our students that I can't, I can't say with any degree of certainty, but certainly could estimate that approximately 50% of seniors are taking an additional challenging course of some sort, although it may not be in history. Some, for example, some students who are going, as Jason had articulated, in the, into the STEM field might, in that particular year, take uh, honors biomed, they had taken AP biology the previous year, and now with that open social studies option, they're now taking um, AP chemistry. And so, it, one way or another, it will have an impact on um, what students must do and could have an impact on what students are, are, are looking at doing, either in terms of their core options and extending their core, um, their, their core choices or their elective choices. So it's one more spot in their schedule. You know, the students have you know, four years, there's 28 spots in their schedule roughly, uh, if you take away the alternating uh, or semester-long courses that they have to fit, but 28 full spots that they need to fit in their schedule. So if we're going to mandate one more and provide a variety of options within that, certainly a student who's taking the advanced placement options could conceivably have the same ability to do what it is that they're doing. But about half the students, and in the, again, that's an estimate, but about half the students at least seek to fill their schedule with another challenging academic option that's going to have them prepared often pr programmatically for what they're looking to do at the post-secondary level. Right. And then there are other students who are saying, I would really like to take two physical education courses or I, would, I want to take PE and art and a computer science class. So it varies. So there's that availability though. I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. limit a student who's advancing themselves through high school if they've decided that no matter how important world history or um, U.S. history is, has that availability to kind of further themselves in advance for science. Mm -hmm. So, good. Well, uh, that's, uh, maybe I might have just misunderstood or something, but that's like, that's not what I heard in that. So I might, uh, just for my own clarification. Um, so like if a student already has their three, already has their three years of, the three years of history that would have been required beforehand. Um, there would be room in their schedule that senior year to take that fourth now required class and still take something that they want to take because it's going to further well, them in what they want to do. Depending on whether or not, but what it is, is it, it, it does put, she'd ask the question, does that limit? It limits one option potentially in, in that, the, in the way that students are using that now varies widely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So does that make a little yep. bit more sense in terms of clarifying? So I don't want to say yes, it limits them and to everything that they can do. It doesn't, it provides them with another, 
educational opportunity that has intent behind the, the programming um, that has uh, civic responsibility at, at its core. And, um, you know, I think that's worth considering. Are any other districts looking into extending their requirements to four years? I know that this is what they're currently doing. That's what they're currently doing. And in some, in a couple of the districts, they indicated that they recommend four years. They don't require it, but they recommend it. But at this point in time, no. When I sent this email out asking this information from superintendents, nobody indicated that it was under examination currently. I'd love to lead the way. So can you clarify, and I know we, we need to um, take action on the program of studies for so this you, coming year, but this can be something that, do we need to decide this tonight or no? No. So that would just mean somebody can put a motion that says, well, you, can, you can make a motion, whatever you would like. You can move to approve the program of studies um, with, a, with the change of maintaining a three-year requirement, so that would imply adjustments. You can, the program of studies, uh, and a four-year social studies requirement, which is essentially as it's presented, or you can, anyone can move anything they would like to see. Hey, Andy, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Uh, sorry, just one with this, to what class would this apply? The, the current are, seventh graders. The current seventh graders seven. when they graduate. Okay. So no current high school classes now. Class of 2020. So those classes, if they were to be offered, they could obviously take them if they want. When they get into high school, absolutely. Yeah, this is, so we're talking, these are high school level courses. The seventh, the seventh grade takes ancient civilizations and geography too. The eighth grade takes Massachusetts and U.S. government and civics is what. Maybe I should ask you like this, when would the classes start to be offered if we were to next year, or two years from now? Two years, right. Two I don't see it in next year's current schedule, so. Yeah, Paul, yeah. The, middle, the middle school curriculum will change next year, so. My understanding is that next year, the current eighth grade, rather than taking World History One, is going to take um, Massachusetts, US Massachusetts, government and U.S. government and civics. And so the courses, um, next year's course offerings, there would still be uh, a U.S. No, actually, all four. It looks like would have to be next year. There's US 1, US 2, World 2. I'm looking at the um, draft schedule that's also in the packet. Um, yeah, I think they made some assumptions in terms of te potential teacher assignment in there. And is World 1 like isn't in there now because the current right. eighth grade is taking the World 1. Right. No. So next year's schedule, next year's schedule has US 1, US 2, and World 2 because the current eighth grade took World 1. Right. So it doesn't impact next year's schedule. Okay, thanks. So this trajectory would roll out in the 2021 coconut year? Yeah, start to see it in the schedule, that. right? Got it. And is any of the staff independent, <clears throat> or is this something that if we decide to do, we're committed to, and then we have to figure that part out afterwards? Uh, no, not in terms of expertise. We, we would need to do it in the context of our existing staffing. It's not like we could put a graduation requirement in place and then uh, take on more staffing yeah. on top of that. And so change. Jason's, Mr. Burns' thinking is <clears throat> that there are there is sufficient human resources to do this. I wrote in my notes to you that I, when I say the district, that's a fancy way of saying me, I have not done that analysis and I just didn't have time to do that analysis prior to this meeting. And as I said, I, I just didn't catch it when it was in the program of studies. If that's an analysis you'd like me to do prior to finalizing that decision, I can add to what Mr. Burns has, he does not believe that there would be an impact, but I would sit with them and say, okay, let's schedule this out then to, to see that. So I can't definitively. I trust his assessment, I do, but my next step <coughs> is let's, let's work it out. Well, see, I, uh, my opinion, I think, on this is that I like the direction it's going, but I think having a little bit more information about the financial impact um, would help us just make a fully informed decision and if there is any potential negative impact on these other electives being able to be selected, that, you know, that's, I think it would be just good to hear mm -hmm. the perspective on um, 
whether or not there's, a, I get it's one slot that we're mm -hmm. saying, okay, now this slot that is taken up uh, by World History 2 is no longer available for something else. I don't know how that's typically being used by seniors right now. Mm -hmm. Well, we could, we could maybe yep. put something, yeah. Can look that great. It might be good to know. What would you like to move to do this week? Uh, well, I guess the question is, are there any other questions or concerns on the program of studies absent this graduation requirement change? Which would this is Paul Watson. I, I, like the, I like the increased emphasis on civics. I think it's great, as uh, yeah. Mara said, they're really supportive. Any other comments? I love the, <coughs> the literature and drama class. Some of the classes that you've mentioned sound really neat. Like the, the war literature one, too. The, I love the fact that they're co-teaching. That's a really great um, use of talent to find the innovative middle ground between two disciplines. So I really like that we're doing that. So all in all, um, I think the program of studies looks great. Yeah, I like seeing the theater arts in there too. I think we talked previously about some of the theater mm -hmm. um, curriculum getting back in here. So mm -hmm. I like yeah. some of the just the diversity of the options for students to have as these electives too. I like mm -hmm. to see that as they start to progress, just having that array of options. Yeah, because that's kind yeah. of what we've been talking about too, yeah. making ourselves more unique. Some of these are pretty. Um, unique courses, so yeah. I think that's exciting to talk about. Yeah, um, I agree with. Um, with the idea of um, advancing ourselves and, and paving the way with the curriculum in regards to the social studies. But I would, I would echo if we could um, get a little bit more information and maybe that would um, give us a little bit more time to kind of um, wrap our heads around after this discussion and come back to it, if, if that's possible for next meeting. So I've written down that I am going to follow up with uh, information on financial impact and potential financial impact and the potential impact on elective choices for really for the most part we're talking seniors mm -hmm. three versus four years so we can vote to approve everything minus minus that change yeah and I guess one other question I would have is you know looking at this you know English math social studies and science your four core areas we're we're kind of through this, privileging social studies above the science, which you know, right, so you, that right, you have three years still in science, and, right? Yeah, and I guess I, it would be good just to get a take from the faculty from the science perspective as to you know, does that seem? I, I know we can't privilege everything. Yeah, and but, I, I, you know, I think we're the science department may may be at a disadvantage just through the course of retirement next year. They're, they're not going to leave any, you know. There's going to be a different set of uh, folks representing that department potentially, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it would be important to really use past and, and upcoming registration numbers, mm -hmm. given the fact that we'd be staying the same anyways, yeah. um, to see what options over the last couple of years, once students have completed that requirement, what have they chosen to do? Yeah. You know, I know in at least one year we we had difficulty filling students' schedules. Um, and we had a number of students who had fallen out of the schedule and although it wasn't a huge number it was more significant really than our faculty wanted to take on in terms of in empty independent studies and teaching assistantships which is why we changed the format for taking on teaching assistants and uh, in independent studies and, and made those more rigorous <clears throat> and really I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, each of the department chairs and each of the members of the faculty who did a phenomenal job, I think, of, of being really creative and, and innovative and putting together new coursework that was really that's really consistent with our expertise and also some, some research that they've done on the outside and things that would be attractive to our students. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to echo that. It's great to see some of these electives and core courses. All right, is there um, a motion then to approve the program of studies uh, without the asterisk uh, no changes to social studies without mm -hmm. graduation requirement. Without yes. changes to that, because I think there are forced changes. So without changes to the history, social studies graduation requirement right. at this time. Right. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Yes. Thank you.
before we move on from that, I'm just curious, not that I'm proposing any more work, but I'm just curious if we've done any polling or gathered any information from seniors, how they feel leaving the school, if they feel like they've had viable options and felt like they got as much as they wanted out of their variety of courses. And then, Is that I, I don't know if there's a way to, like an exit interview almost. You I'm not suggesting, I'm just curious if we've done that's, any. That's the easiest thing on this list, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah, the easiest thing on this list. list. What would you have the done? true benefit of, under, uh, of knowing uh, knowing the impact and whether one is ready to handle civic life and have a historical context comes later. Years I agree. later, right? Like if, if we look at our own mm -hmm. training history, I wish that I had placed greater emphasis on it. And looking at what is happening in our society right now, I wish more of our schools had more years of emphasis. Um, I think it was, um, with the Model T, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me a faster course, mm -hmm. right? So I think we should caution ourselves when asking students because they're ready to get out of here. And I'm sure they're not, you know, they wouldn't be excited necessarily to take a fourth year. But um, if we know if we know what's right for them, and if, if and I would be more in favor of asking Angie Cullinan what colleges and employers are interested in well-rounded students with civic experience, um, service, you know, um, yeah. But I think you, I've also seen, I think maybe it's on the choice exit mm -hmm. survey that you've asked about this in terms of kind of category of mm -hmm. right. reason why leaving, mm -hmm. like is it, does it have to do with right. um, athletics? Does it have to do with course offerings? Does it have to do something completely different? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those other things. I, I just, if there's any information that might sure. point towards helping to shape that, <coughs> for sure. And I, I don't think I would ask, would you like another graduation requirement? <laughs> so, right. Right. I want to ask our seniors that. How about we extend the school year for you all and you take some more right. courses? Right. Right. But uh, maybe just more generally, what kinds of courses would you like to see the school offer? What do you wish we had more of? What right. courses what do you currently, or, you know, do you really enjoy? Right. So, and I think we will have a fair number of students who really we do have students who go on to major in history. They really enjoy it here. So. Well, and it might give us some more feedback too. If maybe we should be offering more science, or maybe we should sure. be offering right. more math. And and having science students with you know really strong historic like historical fundamentals is mm -hmm. so important. And mm -hmm. to all all the majors. So. Um, I, I'd much rather my son take four years of history than a baking class, yeah. which, you know, is an elective option that he chose. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, anyways. All right, so we'll continue this conversation. Know. Sure, yeah. sure. There's a lot of science there. It's going to come in handy one day, but yes. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Beck again is up with uh, the proposed schedule, this doesn't require action, and the NEAS Special Progress Report, neither of which require action, just updates on the schedule. Sure. If we talk to you. Again, we can't yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> so, He's alone in New first, Zealand. More than anything else, this is... Actually, um, hey, can you work the camera up there? Yeah, so you're sick of looking at our lenses? Sorry. Yeah, I'm not getting all on Brian. There we go. There. <laughs> <laughs> so you want, want the bald spot? <laughs> That's it. You yeah, that. yeah. Um, so this is a, a grid that several years ago was actually created by um, Jason Burns and Angie Cullen and Jason was doing an, an administrative internship and trying to put together something that instead of us buying one of those boards to go on the wall, how could we look at <clears throat> physically creating the schedule from year to year um, like many schools do. And then he just created an electronic version and worked that with Ms. Cullen in. Um, this year I wanted to say thank you to uh, April Camuso, uh, who's the head teacher this year, and Angie Cullinan, who worked very hard to look at our current enrollment and project the courses that students would register for. So this is not a schedule. So I don't want you to think that this is anything more than a projection of what we believe we will need next year to be able to do what it is that we want to be able to do. And one of the things that you'll notice, there are a couple of things on here that this, this draft was put together, Ms. Camuso and, and um, 
<coughs> Ms. Cullen had worked very hard on this and they put some things in place that where there are names on here of courses that you didn't approve uh, in the program of studies. So for example, um, art history, Ms. Sousey is not prepared to run advanced placement art history. And although there are a few students who are interested, those students are also interested in other courses. Um, and she's not prepared to run the advanced placement in art history because she really needs to do coursework through the college board to be able to get the syllabus run. But that doesn't necessarily mean that she can't put other art options in place. And so she scheduled a couple of other art options. <clears throat> so if you're not looking at this as being something that's really hard and fast, but you're looking at sort of estimated numbers, you know, you can look at our some of our larger sections, um, for example, in, in, in mathematics, uh, may require that we make changes to split sections up. You know, while 21 is not a huge number, it's certainly not a large number for um, students in an advanced or an honor section. We want to make sure that college prep students who are being tested um, are going to get the lowest possible ratio. For example, in this year in, in algebra, we have a, a class of 13 and a class of 7. Uh, in Algebra 1 in the ninth grade, which is, that's a great ratio to be able to work with a teacher. Um, and I would just level. add one of the things, one of the reasons that, that Brian and I wanted to do this, as Brian said, if students haven't seen anything, they haven't registered, this is a complete projection. We, we wanted, if you recall last year we brought to you, it was, it was closer to me <coughs> to say, it appears that we have a problem, right? right. There's, we have these, in, larger enrollment in math courses than we want and under enrollment here and we decided this year we wanted to begin looking at this as early as possible so if we need to make changes like that we can inform parents well in advance not over the summer we can inform students before they pick those courses we can try we'll probably the plan is to run two tests of this schedule with students run one test and then make adjustments as needed and most importantly if we had to make changes we could tell faculty so this is um, us letting you know that we're trying to get ahead of the game this year and pay close attention to this to give people more notice. So does this kind of roll up to show, all right, for each teacher, here's how many you know, individual classes and numbers? Yes and no. I mean, they've had, the chairs have provided the opportunity for, like the chairs have, have some so Ms. Camuso and, and, and Ms. Cullen have provide this, provided this to the chairs. And so, uh, you know, teachers always have the opportunity to talk about preferences. They've consulted, um, and you know, there hasn't been any complaining in that regard. It's a good. It's been a good overall collaborative process. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even go so far as to say democratic. Like people are throwing out things and matching themselves up with things that they're passionate about, and also have a high level of expertise in. Um, and we've not really been in a situation or at least we're looking at next year not really being in a situation where you know somebody is in a difficult set of circumstances. And, and, and in those places where we have been, um, for example, we've had the great fortune of having expertise in somebody who's just an unbelievable team player in Karen Sousey, who happens to be uh, an EMT also, um, taking on teaching the health courses, mm -hmm. and uh, ninth grade health courses. And so that's worked out very well, and she's become really skilled with it and made some recommendations as, as to changes that would really update the curriculum and um, you know so we've been very, really fortunate that we have a, a really strong collaborative faculty that works well with one another. We do get a general sense of the number of preps that a teacher might have, different yeah. courses of preparation to get a general sense again this is so preliminary after we've tested it once we'll, we'll include updates for you so you can see where the, the, where the enrollments are falling out. Okay. Mm -hmm. and the town me. course also, just, yeah. that's something that uh, I'm really grateful that the Chief Spank Naval in <coughs> Public Safety are working to create a course that they actually would use their staff to teach. So it would have very little impact on us at all and hopefully would prepare students who are interested in perhaps working as a dispatcher upon graduation or working in the Public Safety Department um, that that's what they're designing the course for. And then chemistry, physics, and history, are those yet to be assigned? Because that has to do with um, retirements yep. or changes in staff. So okay. they're, we don't know who the replacements will be. But those, we assume those would be new names on the Correct. List as opposed to shifting Correct. one of the, okay. Exactly. All right. Stop. <laughs> it's all caps too. You can't miss it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we left someone off the schedule. Oh, no. <laughs>
that was just it's me. There. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it's very helpful to see. Yeah, April, uh, April Camusa and, and Angie Kalman did a phenomenal job of mm -hmm. making this work, and, and in really short time. Uh, I'm very impressed with their work. Okay. <coughs> Music, right? Yep. And so this Friday we have due and, and have prepared at this particular point, I simply need to meet with our follow-up committee um, to run all of the, the entire packet by them. I've just given you basically <clears throat> the summaries that will lead, the, there were three items that we needed to respond to in our special progress report. Um, one of them you guys got a summary on last year, uh, summary responses to items one and two. Um, I had done a PowerPoint presentation on our progress to date. And then on January 7th, we completed our um, statement of core values. Our statement was adopted in November. Um, our civic and social expectations, school-wide civic and social expectations had been adopted before the visit even occurred because we made a decision really to focus on behavioral concerns as we had some, some challenges in our climate and our culture. <coughs> and on January 7th, we completed the process of, of approving language for a set of academic, school-wide academic learning expectations that need to be measurable, and so those are included also in your packet for your information. The faculty is actually voting on those now on Google Apps and so far because we had consensus it's a unanimous vote uh, to approve. Um, so we'll be submitting that uh, along with the documentation of the process and um, so forth to uh, the Commission on Public Secondary Schools on Friday. It's, a, it's an upload. Of a, of a document that's roughly the size of the school committee packet itself. So I didn't include that whole packet in here um, just because that would have been painful for your people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and I also couldn't get it to uh, actually work on our scanner at school, which made me crazy. Um, and, and D had left and locked me out of the central office, so I couldn't go over and use the fancy one over there. Um, the other item, summary response uh, and support documents for item three ensure that all aspects of the school culture are safe, positive, respectful, and supportive, including enforcement of the school code of conduct, which is fair and equitable. So I broke this down into several components that are sort of along the lines of um, a combination of what they ask for in the special progress report item uh, that's aligned with work that we were either doing or had, are preparing to do. So for example, physical safety, we had an enormous amount of interaction, not only with public safety personnel in Hadley, a great deal of training and so forth, not just with our teachers, but also with our kids. Um, and you know, there are three separate enhanced lockdown procedures that they did with our students uh, here at Hopkins Academy, which was great. Um, and they kept it lighthearted, but serious, all at the same time, without it being something that was fearful. <coughs> um, and so the only thing that is not included in your summary that I actually need to add in is we had just done the reunification training on our faculty meeting on, on February 4th. Um, so there'll be one or two more just items that are added in uh, in terms of physical safety. Um, second category is screening, risk identification, and conduct data trends. Uh, I shared an email earlier in the year. Um, April Camusa, who's the head teacher, had done an analysis and yeah it's wonderful to be in a school district where our biggest problem at, at our high school is tardiness um, <clears throat> but 24 per percent of our kids exceeding five tardies in a semester is, is a problem especially when we're, we're a small town we're close together and we provide transportation for kids so we really need parents to help kids to be able to understand that um, being on time is important when, when you see that a quarter of our students come to school late in the course of the semester a significant number of times um, it requires that we do something different as a school community and if that means that we, Ms. Camuso and I need to come <clears throat> back and, and take a look at some of those issues with you and, and change our levels of accountability with regard to that then maybe that's something that we'll do but in the meantime we've, we've chosen to work with our most egregious offenders as partners with their family um, doing things like removing privileges and so forth until they get themselves together. I would um, ask you also to consider what are positive rewards that one could have for those who do arrive on time. It's an interesting point. And one of the other items that's actually added to that category of screening, identification, and risk is uh, we're exploring the process of adding PBIS, which, as you know, has been successfully run down the middle school um, or down at the elementary school, that uh, 
we're just beginning the process of exploring that with our middle school team and, and having conversations about how that might work. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us in, in the process of accreditation where down there they have the HOCS acronym and that HOCS acronym has created for them a set of core values and beliefs that they adhere to and then they celebrate um, exemplary status within each of those that we need to go through that process and through the remainder of the school year and hopefully it will also align with our newly developed core values, you know, things like integrity, respect, um, equity, responsibility. These are all things that we identified as a school community, of not just faculty, but parents and students made substantial contributions to, the use, to that language. Mm -hmm. And so we should have buy-in in that process from visioning. So whatever it is that we look to do in, in terms of um, rewarding behaviors that we expect to see um, and, and expect to see done well, mm -hmm. Uh, that hopefully will have that same type of alignment that they have down at the elementary school. Um, there are a couple of other screenings. Yes? So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on the cause of that consistent tardiness. Um, <clears throat> I think it's just a, it's a lack of emphasis in, the, in, a, in a school community, whether that comes from this, the, from me as, as a, the school administration, that, you know, we in, We've had uh, five parties in place for a long period of time um, as being something that we allow before we put a sanction in place. Um, and other school districts that I've worked, it's been three in the course of a semester. And so maybe we need to reduce it because clearly people, families and students don't, aren't emphasizing um, or don't have the sense of emphasis for the value of punctuality. I mean, as, as you know, we all know, not showing up on time for a job is the quickest way to lose your job. And so if, if we're not effectively making that point, we're not effectively using our student code of conduct. It's not a minimal thing. And I appreciate the fact that, again, I get to collaborate with somebody like Ms. Camuso, who um, you know, has made that a point of emphasis by pointing out that data. And it's important for them to know the, the sort of negative consequences of tardiness, and also important to learn the positive consequences of showing up on time. Mm -hmm. there, like all the rewards, <coughs> the, the early bird does really catch the worm. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, 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 uh, you could get pretty creative about how to reward their arriving on time. Bigger worm budget. Just one more thing, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to excuse tardiness. Uh, I just also wonder if this ties into the conversation we're having about start time for school. Mm -hmm. Uh, my kids are starting school an hour later here. They haven't been tardy once. Uh, which makes it easier. And then, so, something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we also included, uh, I included an item in here about this, the addition uh, that the school committee had in terms of increasing the time of the school adjustment counselor from a 0.5 to a 0.8 FTE. Um, that adjustment counselor currently has uh, 14 students specifically either in check-in, check-out check out circumstances on a regular basis or um, on behavior plans uh, and an overall caseload of 25 students that they're seeing on a regular basis. And so that's significant, substantially more students than we were able to provide services for. Um, and we're seeing improvements in, in, in behaviors and, and um, you know, specifically from some students who are, are, have been really challenged. They found the um, the support to be something that's allowed them to be able to, to make improvements and thrive and build confidence. So that's been a great change for us as well. Um, climate and cultural programming is also a category, everything from the fact that uh, we went to uh, the Massachusetts Commission on Discrimination as an administrative team uh, and completed their work last year to the trained active bystanders, the civic dialogue training um, <clears throat> that's being put in place with CES, our partnership, and I also shared this detail with you last, last year in a, in a PowerPoint that was part of that NEASC presentation. Uh, the work of the Gender Equity Task Force last year in terms of our programming, as well as rolling out the um, hashtag um, Recognize Sexism uh, campaign. Uh, all of those were important cultural issues. And then um, equitable enforcement of the Student Code of Conduct. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've acted quite unilaterally since I've gotten here, as, as uh, there had been uh, a dean of students in the past, and so there's at least somebody to bounce some things off of, and I think it's really important that uh, when in dealing with discipline one, not only do we stick with the handbook, but we treat it like we do common law, that we, um, we follow through with a degree of consistency uh, with regard to penalties, 
that are related to particular offenses and having the opportunity to bounce something off of a member of the faculty who is willing to hold me accountable with a degree of honesty, respect, and dignity has been very helpful and through the first part of the school year for us to uh, really have a clear sense of, you know, I leave a conversation with a colleague and I know exactly what it is that I'm doing and um, instead of just making a unilateral decision, being able to bounce that off of somebody, that, that level of calibration has worked really well for us and I think ultimately serves students well. Safe reporting for students. Um, the Gender Equity Task Force completed a review of uh, gender equity concerns in athletics uh, and left feeling that the school committee, that um, the athletic director, that the boosters are very attentive to uh, spending money uh, on the athletic program with a sense of gender equity. Um, and Mr. Sudnick, I also wanted to congratulate for taking steps in the past to have done things like making sure even the boys team was, even though the boys team was a little bit stronger, making sure that the, the pep band was committing their time also as well and the cheerleaders as well to celebrating the girls teams. And of course, we're in a slightly different situation this year. Uh, congratulations to the girls team who has a home playoff game tomorrow night. Um, but he was attentive to make sure that the, uh, really the lesser of the two teams was getting as much attention uh, this year as well. So uh, I'm really pleased with how he has paid attention to those seemingly small details uh, in a way that I think a lot of people might just disregard, um, that he's, he's made that sort of a core value of what he does. The faculty reporting network we've sent out intermittently. Uh, I send it out in emails, and you can see we have it posted up around the building. Um, Ms. Camuso and I know that we'll, we'll need to work with student leaders to rework that for next year. And we actually have had an inquiry from another school who was very pleased with the um, the work that was done on our dress code, and in particular the process that they have a pretty significant numbers, number of people on their faculty who are, you know, uh, let's say as a math teacher might be overly concerned about a spaghetti strap showing and are totally willing to call out a kid in front of <coughs> their peers and, and their students are beginning to push back at it. And so they've reached out to us to say, hey, are there still some student leaders who might be willing to come up and work with some student leaders at our school? So once we get that, um, that opportunity going. Hopefully Jack Kelly, our student representative, will come back and provide a report on the opportunity that our, our student and faculty leaders are providing to spread that information out and, and those processes out into other schools. So I'm pleased with what we've been able to do and we'll, we'll have the follow-up committee sign off on this and upload it on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. Uh, budget. Christian Stanley, what are you even waiting for? <laughs> No, he's I just I just came yes. in general. In general I'm I'm supposed to the school liaison. Shock of all time. Thank yeah. you. Wake me up though. Keep calling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, Chris and I provided kind of an update of where we're at. There, I did attend select board. I think it was select board. Was it Gintong? It was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last week. Last week before. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Three weeks ago. And at that meeting, Mr. Nixon presented his budget to the select board. We had submitted a request of an increase of essentially $331,000. And um, the date, Mr. Nixon, the budget that he presented to the select board has an increase in local contribution of essentially $184,000, $183,875. So it is less than we had requested, although it is an increase of 2.6%. And I do respect greatly that the town, that Mr. <coughs> Nixon, that the select board are trying to meet many, many, many demands. So it is no easy task. I do appreciate all the work that they put into that. So with that new number, we have had some good news as we've explained to the town. Uh, these numbers are, it's very early in the game. So although the request we put forth to the town at this point is less than we had originally requested, we did find out that the preschool grant of $30,000 and $3,000, or $30,000, um, that we had eliminated from the budget, they've now said that this is the last year. So we weren't the only ones confused. I got an email from a neighboring district that said, wait a minute, are we getting the money or not? Mm -hmm. They said, it appears that we are. So we've put that back in. Uh, we did 
reduce because we know what we're getting through Title I and Title II. You notice we originally budgeted for 74000 but actually we're getting closer to 66000 That has to do with the community's wealth increasing because those are tied to community wealth. So it is good news for families that all in all our families are better off financially, but it does have a negative impact on those title grants. Um, circuit breaker estimation has not changed. That could very well change, but it hasn't changed at this point. We, down, we reduced the amount of title money because we know it's going to be less. Uh, our 160, which is our 240 now, oh, it's right in front of me here. Our 240, that has remained the same. School choice applied has remained the same. Pre-K revolving hasn't changed in this iteration. You see the 391, that preschool grant, we added back in $30,000. And the 262 grant hasn't changed. So our total grant revenue funds, we estimated this point to be at roughly 1.2 million. Our total revenues would be local contribution plus that, essentially 8.5. Our budget is just over 8.6 right now, which leaves us with $125,000 deficit roughly. I'm not excited about that at this point because it's so early in the game. It's just so early in the game. So we, are, we still are waiting to find things out mostly about special education. There are a lot of shifting parts in special education right now. Um, some, so there's just a lot of shifting parts. We don't know what circuit breaker reimbursement is going to be yet. So that's why circuit breaker could change. And as you know, our, um, which doesn't affect our applied, but the school choice revenue side of things, I just do a very rough estimate, graduate out the seniors and that's all right. I do. Um, so things are still, and also we don't know what our new hires will cost in history, chemistry, physics, right? We don't know what those will cost. And so um, we'll see, there could be cost savings there. I can't guarantee it given the specialization of some of those areas, but that's why early in the game. But even though there's a big red box that says a deficit of $125,000, I'm here to tell you, I'll let you know when we should be excited. We should not be excited right now. Just enjoy the colors. We really should not be excited at this point. If that shows up in the lunch section of the detailed report. Well, then that is problem. Chris's problem because <laughs> I, when I get lunch reports, I feel like there's a lot of money in that account. You know what I'm thinking is maybe in the future, Anne should do the lunch report again. Yes. <laughs> maybe that'll turn around the program. I tell your parents. I just say everyone relax. You know, it's really it's fine. And I know that the town is also working. Um, but I just want to thank the town for the work they put into this. It is not easy. Every department head comes there with com competing demands, and by gosh, we all think we're the most important person in the room. So it's not an easy task, and you all do a really nice job of listening to us and working hard to try to balance all of those com competing demands, so thank you. And I also know, as Mr. Nixon has said, the numbers on his side are also preliminary because we're right now he's working off of the governor's the cherry sheet right now right so we have very preliminary numbers on his side as well. All right, there was no. Hey, Annie. Yep. Hey, yep. Sorry, I thought uh, we need to. Just to I gotta ring. I gotta ring up. I promise not to get excited about the budget. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? I usually get very excited. <laughs> you can actually uh, perhaps show the folks in New Zealand. This is how it's done in the United States. This just don't get excited. But I'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I don't know how to turn them off. I guess he turned off. Okay. At the bottom. You got it. Uh, G, capital plan. Okay, the girls' locker room. <coughs> Estimator? Okay, so the girls' locker room. <coughs> okay, so the girls' locker room. Yeah. Uh, okay. they, we, we've really yeah. struggled with the girls' locker room. So um, the question, just, just as a reminder, and if we don't have the information for tonight, we may just be updating you on this because I know Chris has been trying hard to get this information. The select board, we have a, a placeholder on the warrant because the school committee is going to decide how much is this to get the estimate and um, do we need to ask the town for help. So there's a placeholder right now and it may be that you're not deciding that tonight. Chris? Uh, probably I'm not <clears throat> because I just checked my email and I got no response. So we, uh, we attempted to get an estimate for the job from one vendor that we were, you know, we were given the name of this company 
after a few phone calls and delays in getting a response from them, I finally managed to speak to the person I needed to who told me they could absolutely do our estimate for our job sometime in uh, the summer of 2020. So oh. I said thank you, but no thank you. Um, <laughs> moved on. I got the name of another company that might uh, be able to do this. They were more local, so that was, uh, I thought, better. And after several back and forths again, I um, reached out to them and I said, listen, I really need to get some kind of a price on what you will charge us for this estimate. And they responded, this project is a lot more involved than we thought it would be. Thank you for the opportunity, but we can't do the job. Try this company. So, <laughs> so uh, I tried the next company. They are in Boston. And I've emailed them asking, you know, basically give them a, a brief outline of what we're looking to do and the fact that I need an estimate for your estimate, more or less, at this point in time. I have not heard back from them yet. Uh, so at this point in time, we have no, no estimate whatsoever on how much, you know, it may cost us to get that. Um, this, is, this is proving to be quite a challenge just to get, <laughs> get a price on how much this project could cost us. And, and the reason, you know, being that we need a, a revised price is just because, you know, the price that we had was 10 years old. So obviously that's way obsolete. If these um, people in Boston don't get back to me in the next couple of days, I'll reach out again. And I will also reach out to the company that did the original plans. I'm thinking maybe they might be willing to do it. Um, then after that, we're really going to have to try something really outside the box because I just don't know, um, you know, what else we can do. <clears throat> Again, getting a price from a contractor is just a tricky thing because you can't expect the guy to, you know, go through these plans and spend really hours and hours to come up with an estimate and then tell him, well, thank you very much. Now we may or may not do this project and you may or may not get it because we're going to go out to bid, you know, and so it, it's, it's really a, a good way to make enemies with the area contractors, and um, it's, it's quite honestly not fair uh, to them. So we'll, uh, we'll keep plugging away, quite honestly, at, uh, at trying to get a price for this. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do these contractors have to have special certifications to do this kind of job? Um, they do need to have, uh, they need to be DCAM certified. It's a, it's a state certification level mm -hmm. uh, because, well, I assume anyway, because of the cost of the job. Um, and, and I'm pretty confident that it will be above that. The, the cost is 150000 and above, so mm -hmm. it, it should definitely um, you know, be above that level. Uh, what we are looking to get for this pricing, because the plans called for both the boys' and girls' locker room to be done, uh, what I want from them is a price to do the girls and then the girls and boys uh, together. So that way we can see if it's something where you know, we need to get the girls done now, Let's get it done and then we can move on to the boys at a later date. Or might it be, you know, to our financial advantage to do them both at once, which, which should in theory be cheaper because they're here. All the tools, everybody's here, you know, so they can, they can just jump on both of them. But again, it would just be, a, you know, kind of an option for us anyway, if nothing else. So, uh, you know, like I said, we'll keep plugging away. We know we have to get this done. And, uh, it sounds like a bit of a chicken in the egg. It's too bad that there isn't some other way, like a contingency, some kind of funding that the town can say, okay, here's, here's an amount, rough amount, now put it out to bid. And so then it's at least increasing the odds that whomever's bidding has a chance of getting a job. Yeah, you know, the, the thing about this is, and, and it really is, the, the chicken and the egg, the horse and the cart, I mean, there's so many things you can use for it. And, and we just experienced this in where. Um, we are going for MSBA funding for windows, new windows in a school, and a boiler. And we needed estimated pricing. And again, how do you get that? We don't even have plans for this yet. So MSBA had some pricing available on their website. I think the window pricing they gave us was 1.2 million. And then after the plans were done, they came with an estimate. It was 3.5. And, and of course, you know, I mean, that's, that's a big difference. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so people asked, why were we given this price? Well, again, you can't just get a price. It's, it's really a complicated thing. Excuse me. And I actually told my boss, I said, what they need is to have some kind of company working for MSBA or, you know, or any kind of school um, project funding like this that could give you an estimate and really just keep things moving a heck of a lot quicker, you know? You need to just do bids. 
So if anybody out there is, uh, is uh, you know, <laughs> looking to start a company, <laughs> contact uh, MSBA. One other yeah. question I have. Um, what if we were to look at um, Massachusetts and Connecticut schools that have recently had their lockers, their girls' lockers in particular, redone, and take a sort of square foot approach at uh, estimating and hmm. taking that to um, the top do you think you might be able to put that on the superintendent's list or something? I can do that. I also was thinking we can contact LPVEC. You know, they do more building than CES. It's okay. kind of their thing. Like, right? Yeah, so you try that. that. Terrific. Oh, they work for the people for a while. Yeah, at least we can stop the cycle, the chicken and egg cycle. <laughs> yeah, right. and start with something. Yeah. Concrete data. Sure. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, on. too, I can talk with uh, Phil, who is our OPM on the senior center and on the fire substation, yeah. mm -hmm. and see if he knows. Oh, that would be great as well, yes. Yeah. And if he knows anybody, I can just come here contact Yeah, that would be knows. great. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Christian, Excellent. you should come more often. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, speaking of building, so right. MSBA statement of interest. This is, here's the time. We are submitting a statement of interest on April 9th. In that statement of interest, we will include our priority project, the girls' locker room, and a secondary project, the univents. The univents on the capital plan are, we don't have those on the capital plan for quite a while, but it's a project that felt appealing to MSBA. By submitting this statement of interest, what we do when we submit the statement of interest, and a part of that statement of interest, it is required that you take a very specific vote that's in your packet, that essentially is just acknowledging that you know that we're submitting a statement of interest. And the select board has to take the same vote so that Chris and I can't go about writing and building projects to the state saying we want funding without the elected official saying, yes, we actually do want to do those projects. What happens in terms of timeline? We submit it on April 9th. It could be that MSBA then identifies our project as a project that they want to learn more about. They could potentially come out and visit and look at the project if they're unfamiliar. They may be familiar because you did an MSBA project for the roof on this building. So they may be familiar with us, but they may come out and visit. And then they invite applicants in, in December. So they invite, uh, or slightly before that. They invite you to apply. The, the, essentially, the, when they've invited you to apply, they're looking to fund your project. They make this distinction right now between a statement of interest and an actual application because they don't have, know how much money they have and they don't know how many people. It's one, one cent on the sales tax, I think, is how they fund it. So it's, they don't have the exact amount of funding yet. They'll know that, and then they have to see how many people apply. And then they make decisions about the types of projects that people are looking for, and they decide which ones they think are high priority or greatest need. Um, but once they say you've, you're invited to apply, that's pretty much a signal you're going to get funding. Yeah, so the statement of interest doesn't mean a thing. They make you say, I understand, there's no guarantee that we'll get this. Um, and then uh, once we do that, we need to follow every step that they lay out. It's pretty complicated. But they're, they're there every step of the way in terms of they require that you put together a building committee. They require that the building committee has representation from the town side, from the school committee side, that it isn't just school department personnel. So they have certain uh, requirements that they expect you to adhere to. And then they, they have funds available for feasibility studies, schematic design, schematics and designs. I did say, well, what if we already have designs for the project? They say, well, we, you have to have somebody that looks at those designs. There's certain composition to the building committee that also includes kind of designers and project managers, and they look at your current designs and decide, yeah, those are fine, we can go ahead with those, or they make other recommendations. Again, you can use MSB funding, MSBA funding for each part of this. Um, and then, if we are selected by MSBA for funding, I ask, so how much funding can the district anticipate receiving? And there's a, a factor. The floor is 31%, 31 cents on the dollar for the project. The ceiling is essentially 80 cents on the dollar, 80%. She suggested that we look back at what we received on our last project. Had we received 49% or 49 cents on the dollar on the last project? Um, and so that probably has a margin of error. I would, I would guess, if anything, it would be slightly less because the factors that they do, each town gets, it's not a set amount for the entire state. So it has to do with the community's wealth. So for example, uh, Chris had mentioned where's MSBA project. 
they're being funded at 80% for a project that they submitted for last year. This is a new round of funding. Um, there, DESE has the wealth factor for every community. DESE gives Ware a one and out of five and Hadley a four. So we're, we're not gonna get 80%. I don't know if our wealth factor has changed since our last project, but somewhere around 49%. Uh, so our goal is to get this in. Hopefully we're invited to apply. We would still be moving forward because if we don't get the funds, we, it doesn't come off the capital plan. But there certainly is the hope that it would be a lot less, it would be half the cost for the town is the goal of doing this. The vote is in your packet. Do we need to read it as is? Is that the motion? That is, need to read the box. that is the box. That is it. You may read it. I am happy to read it. It's pretty chunky language, but that is that is the vote. So I can do. Am I allowed to read it? You are absolutely right. right. Are there any questions before we move forward? With no, that? I think no. this is yes. a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Resolved. Having convened in an open meeting on February 25th, 2019, prior to the SOI submission closing date. The School Committee of Hadley, Massachusetts, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form dated April 9, 2019, for Hopkins Academy, located at 131 Russell Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future girls' locker room, and Univents projects. These projects are the redesign and update of girls' locker room and replacement of old malfunctioning heating Univents, and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Is there a, do we need a roll call vote? No, no. Okay, Just is, is there a motion to move forward as stated? Move to do that. <laughs> Seconded. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. So we, we will need the Board of Selectmen basically oh, to, to do that you. same vote. Because you're here and you know the length of this two-sentence um, yeah. resolution, you can step out of the room for a minute when they're looking for somebody to read it. So <laughs> I thought you memorized it. I'd like to meet the superintendent that just goes out and applies for building projects without their school. Yeah. I just want to meet that person. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, phase one, fields. Yes. So I think most of this... Uh, right now we have some updates for you regarding discussion over land ownership, but some of that and the school committee's response to that is done in executive session because it has to do with uh, property and uh, acquisition. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Transportation, update on the bid process and single tier <coughs> option. And so my question before Chris can tell you his update on the bid process, but what would you if I were to ask families, so what we're looking at on a single tier, we've gone out to, our bid includes, as I'll say it as Chris has said, doing uh, two tiers or doing one tier, so they're both in the bid. But in terms of getting feedback from families, if you want me to get family feedback so you can look at making a final decision around start times when you have bid information as well. Uh, we're looking at a start time, Hadley Elementary would not really change at all, maybe a couple of minutes, and Hopkins Academy would move up to about 8 o'clock, or shortly after 8 o'clock. The big change is it's a single tier, so all the students are riding together. Um, similar kinds of stops, but all students are together. Is there information you would like me to ask directly from families to bring back to you for consideration? My only question would be, would it impact a parent's decision to put or not put their child on a bus? Okay. If, I, I'm just curious, would you still continue taking the bus if this change were in place? And I wonder if it should be asked in the context of, um, you know, from both sides, yeah. in terms of high school students 
Gene would Gene increase the chances that your child will actually catch the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In light of the fact that it'll probably be right. substantially later. So I can go through some basic questions around overall impressions. Does a change like this feel positive? Mm -hmm. Layout. Here's here's the real change. The real change mm -hmm. is about delaying the start time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it's we really we could do this in a way that is more economical. Mm -hmm. So you know how do you feel about that change? And then um, how do you feel about uh, ridership change? I will point out to families that those children who are taking the late bus, which is a good handful of children that use the late bus, we do have mixed ridership in the afternoon. So. I'm wondering if, um, you know, I, I'm looking for a forum that would invite parents who feel strongly about this one way or another to feel like they have a, a place that they can come in and talk about this. We've had somebody come in during public comment and talk about the research behind the start time and why we should change it. I've not heard the opposite, and, and I'm just, I don't know whether we need a deliberate agenda item on a school committee meeting and kind of making sure people are aware that this is actively being discussed and we would value your input either way, because I, I just, I would worry that somebody would, you know, feel like they didn't have an opportunity yeah. to be heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so like, this is, I, I think that this is a conversation that, like, we. Obviously, people don't show up to our school committee meetings, but if this was something that, no offense, if this was something that people, that, that people yes. had more yeah. headway on, so if this was something that yeah. would be like in a superintendent's email yeah. or something yeah. like that. Right, so. so how about in March, just because I'm mindful too, if we're going to do something mm -hmm. and, and budget-wise, yep. is it, does it make sense to really try to, this is an opportunity, this is what we're considering, yes. please we, come we in and talk to your feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. We want you here. Yes. Because mm -hmm. okay. when would we need to vote on that? Well, we're going to do public hearing on the budget in April, um, and but it's not as much the budget as it is more just people feeling like they have a chance to talk about it. So really, any time before the end of the year, and once the bid is opened, I'm sorry, we only have we have to award the contract within a month. Is that so Thirty right? days, yeah. Thirty days. And that, that, but that, and that decision would would change the bid that we're putting that we're that we're asking. that we right. right that Which we select right. right. So if we're you put putting it out, four bids actually. Okay. Right, for right. the different options. Right, we're eat, you know, one tier and two tier the way it is now with yeah. the buses split mm -hmm. between the town and the vendor. And then one tier and two tier with the vendor doing all of the routes. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully, you know, companies will bid on all four of them. It'll just give us a, a better choice and then we can decide how we want to handle that. So and what's the closing date on those bids? Um, the ad is in the newspaper. It's posted on the state website. I think it went in today, actually, on the state website. The bids have to be back into us by March 20th. That's when we open it, March 20th. Yeah, so you could you so could hear from parents in our April meeting. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah. So here, have people have a part of our meeting in March, and then in April would be our deciding meeting where we would vote and mm -hmm. select the transportation. Yeah. And we would have the information on the financial aspects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the April meeting. For the April yeah. meeting, and um, we would be able to make sure to solicit information to parents other than in our agenda. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The yeah. And also, I would just superintendent the, weekly email, I would yeah. probably send out, I'd send the survey out maybe within that and separately, I'd yeah. make sure it was the parents were getting that information. Perfect. Great. Okay. All right, so we'll put it in. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys get to pick a calendar. <laughs> These were fun to look at. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> all right, the 1920 20 calendars. Do. So we have some options here. So you saw the biggest change is uh, in draft A, we do what we always do. We come back the day after uh, New Year's Day, which happens to fall on a Thursday. That's not a big deal. I mean, we have two day weeks with students sometimes. But that also means, again, assuming no snow days, I never thought I'd say, well, that will never happen, mm -hmm. but so far this year it might happen. Uh, that school ends on a Monday. Uh, Right, with no snow days in June if you come back on the Thursday. And then the other one, I just looked at it and said, oh, well, I suppose we could just have a full two week break uh, mm -hmm. around uh, at the end of December. We could have a full two week break through New Year's. Mm -hmm. And then school ends on a Wednesday in that scenario. That's really the only difference. And of yeah. course, the quarter dates change slightly depending on when your vacation ends. And 
I ran it by D. I said, what do you think families would think? And we said, well, here's, they could like this or they could not like this. And I said, guess what? Give me two and the school committee will choose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I ran it by a student at Hopkins. <laughs> Your focus group? Of My one. focus group of one. <laughs> no, I mean, it, to your point, it, it seems like if we were going to be ending on a Monday and in order to extend the, the break over the holidays, because the holidays fall right in the middle of the week, to have two full weeks and still get out of school the, the same week, mm -hmm. you know, just a Wednesday, not a Monday. A couple of days I, yeah, I was in favor of draft B to offer families that two weeks of time holiday-wise um, to not split it up and come back on January 2nd. So you're basically adding two days at the end of the year in order to gain two days and a weekend over the holiday time. That, and I think, I don't know, I know people's work schedules are all different and they may need more coverage because we're not coming back to school on the second. I know I don't get, I don't think I get the second off. But um, it seemed like there's, I don't know what attendance is usually like this year, you know, right when we came back. When did we come back this year, January? Uh, the actual, this year's calendar is the final calendar that was in there, and we came back, <coughs> we came back on the second on a Wednesday. Yeah. So we came back on a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah my, just devil's advocate, less about, of course, the students would be happy to have TOEFL weeks off, but the hardship on, on parents for two weeks for working yeah. with parents, yeah. it might be more hard in the middle of the winter to do that rather than ending school on a Monday which may possibly be changed due to snow days anyway. Yeah. It's so. true and I, um, I mean, if, the weather is pretty unpredictable, right? So if we did have five full days there, it, essentially they'd be getting out that last week in June. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it takes away from the warmer mm -hmm. months. Well, the, the 24th would be the last day if there were five snow days. Five, right. Yes. The 19th otherwise. Yeah. Just to put it out there, I'm personally more in favor of going back on the 2nd, just to not as make as much of a hardship, because if parents do have time off in that break, then they probably don't have off Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. my two cents. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, there's the plus side of... Um, starting back after vacation with a half week or like a really short week it makes it a little bit easier to ease back in mm -hmm. kind of like our august start. Mm -hmm. yeah martin luther king holidays a little bit later the 20th mm -hmm. this year so that sorry in 2020 mm -hmm. so they would have a little bit of a holiday coming up after they come back mm -hmm. Right, and if you look at that from an alternative, just to point that out, if you started school on the 6th, then they'd have one full week of school, and then the following week they'd have a day off and a half day. So mm -hmm. they'd only have one week back, and then you'd, mm -hmm. you'd have more time. Mm -hmm. So what are we thinking? A or B? It's a lose-lose, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I really could go either way. Yeah. But I, uh, I think I'm more in favor of a longer summer vacation <coughs> for them. Getting out of school earlier, um, earlier in June, um, and having it be an easier time getting back to school in January when it's cold and miserable and no one wants to go back to school. Okay. Having a couple of days rather than a full week is just, uh, it, I know it'll be easier on, on my home front. Mm -hmm. I agree. I can go either way. I can go, I, I can go either way. This is person yeah. is going to be harder on my home front, but I mean, that's just one guy. <laughs> For um, me, I was looking at people that travel over the yeah, holidays that's what and I was being thinking. able to kind of maximize that last weekend and having having a longer break over that time. But that's, you know, and I, and I think that my poll of one, that was what, <laughs> what their opinion was too, was kind of like on the second, how much, you know, I'm, I, my friends are not going to be back at school necessarily. Why, you know, not my friends that aren't here in this district, why are we going back as early as the second? 
Then I don't know what other account. I don't right. know what mm -hmm. other calendars yeah. are doing. Just know mm -hmm. that we don't, because other people haven't set their calendar. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what they will do. But. I always have a hard time with the idea of going back to anything, whether it be a work trip or school or a, a vacation or anything in the middle of a week, especially towards the end. Like if somebody's like sick on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they show up to work on Friday, like seriously, why did you come to work on Friday? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way to tell, so looking back at uh, mm -hmm. the calendar you gave us for this year mm -hmm. that we approved in May. So we opened back up on Wednesday the 2nd. Mm -hmm. Do we know, like, do we have a high number of absences? So I can get any data that you want. It's okay if you approve the calendar next month. I just didn't want to forget. This is another oh, yeah. one of those things that I think families not, appreciate. Yeah, it as early and as thank goodness for Mr. Burns who said, "Hey, we're going to do the calendar." So <laughs> there's an idea. I completely <laughs> forgot about it. So um, I can get data on attendance. I can also ask other school districts if they've set their calendar. If we can have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for for me, I. Um, Stanford goes into shutdown for like yep. an extra week, and so I have the time off. We can totally manage it, uh, but I do think it, it could become, it's a very privileged thing that I, that I have that flexibility right. and that my you know, other half doesn't, is at home, and so, but. Uh, but I mean, right, either, way gonna, either, either way right. you're gonna be trying to get, like, uh, whether the parents are gonna be needing to take the time off in the middle of, the winter, I, know, I think I feel the like summer, it's going to be. If, it's, if you're not from a position of privilege, that you have summer accommodations that you have to make anyways, right. and so those are those are things that you're prepared for and you can manage. Um, but it's uh, not not the case necessarily the week after Christmas and New Year's. And it might be a hardship for some families to get time off around that time, mm -hmm. as you say. Mm -hmm. If companies are closed, that's easier. But you know. If a company doesn't close and you're expected to go to work, it does right? Or if you're an hourly wage earner, if you're in the service sector, exactly, it right. means that that will be more challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then uh, having it's, it's hard to make this no decisions based it's on our yeah our experiences and our preferences. Because then draft A, if there's the five school days, you're asking them to come back to, to the last day of school on a Monday. Right. Who's going to come to school for the last day on Monday? Is that going to be how, 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 like how actually attended would that be? Last days tend to be fun. <laughs> and you're giving, you know, with teacher gifts and <clears throat> carting all your stuff out of school. And so I, I can envision that I could push my kid out the door easily on Monday if it's the last day of school. <laughs> so on calendar B, a drop B with the last day with five snow days, mm -hmm. let's be pessimistic here, January 24th. Mm -hmm. How does that butt up against like graduation and other? Because I forget how that. Factors. Sure. So twelve, they. Um, it's not the snow days. It's twelve days from the last scheduled day of school. So on. I should have done that for you. So on draft B, the seventeenth. Yeah. So. Yeah, you would still have. Well, the fifth would you would have you'd be plenty with the first Friday. You'd, you'd okay. be well within the law. On the fifth. And I think in both drafts on the fifth, you're well within the law. So, do either of these drafts impact when graduation would need to? Because I know, like the last conversation we had about what establishing this graduation mm -hmm. date, we wanted to be sure we weren't like disadvantaging the seniors by keeping them here so long mm -hmm. right, <laughs> right. And, and scheduling it at, at the best opportunity so on draft day you would have the option within the law of setting graduation for the 29th the last friday in may mm -hmm. so the law is it has to be within 12 days of the last scheduled day you don't have to worry about snow days and you've mm -hmm. met the regulations so you're still doing this as i look at it so you're absolutely within those 12 days on that last friday Okay. Because their senior week counts as their time in school. On draft B, the last Friday in May becomes, um, if, now we've typically always done the first Friday in June, we made that exception this year because of how the calendar fell, yep. but that last Friday then technically has you at 13, right? 
um, yeah, that's 13 days that last Friday. It's not 12 days. So, yeah. Yeah. May 8th. so um, no, the, to the, the first, it would be the first Friday in June. Got it. And would either of these have any impact on ESY or anything like that? No, no. All right, do we want to have a little bit more information about absentees or do we feel like we can decide this now? Because one thing, just before I present, and I don't sound like a big genre on this, I learned a hard lesson with the last, with our previous union president, Mr. Horgan, our school psych. Um, this is one of those things that you don't want to open it up to too much input. Data is good, yeah. but you don't, yeah, lesson right. learned the hard way. Not that I don't value opinions, I'm a big survey gal, as you guys know, but because there's not going to be one solution right. that everyone said that's great, yep. right. and then once they were invited in, and, and then it was, and you're not going to get that. It's just, it's just easier to kind of say, right. oh, this is where we're going. But more data, sure. I just wouldn't, if you were thinking, I, would, I wouldn't open it up. Survey to students. It could be completely yeah. Yeah. circumstantial. No. It could have been a really bad yeah. school year. Yeah. And that's why yeah. It's circumstantial. Yeah, I don't, even, I don't know what data we could be getting. No, no <laughs> the only thing I was thinking was more, um, if we come back the second, it has history shown that kids don't show up, mm -hmm. that there are absences, that kids are called in anyways because like this year, it fell in the middle of the week. Mm -hmm. But and, and the only other thing I would say is if you wanted me to ask for calendars from other districts, which hadn't been set yet, but will be set by next month, if that interests you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or we can go with, I'm, I'm fine going with draft A, if that seems to be where we're leaning um, mm -hmm. with, the, with the consideration that um, May 29th being a graduation date, I think that's great. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's where I'm, I'm leaning. Um, we good with that motion? Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could defend or throw down or, or <laughs> yeah, either one of these. So. <laughs> All right. Just curious before you, um, mm -hmm. we're gonna do the the same thing's gonna apply for the following year. It looks like annual town elections is a school day and then the curriculum day falls on off no. so next year annual town elections will be day no curriculum day. day okay and then after that the senior center will be built and elections will move okay oh. yeah. yeah parents will be much happier with that because yeah. of security yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> listen christian's like we hope no i just spoke it loudly and <laughs> <laughs> i spoke it loudly and no one could hear your rebuttal <laughs> And a select board member was present. <laughs> In 2020, okay. if they are here, you gotta you gotta have that day not be a school day. If that's they both count. Yeah, but you don't have 2020 calendar yet. Yeah. Or that will be 2020. That is 2020. 2020 yeah. April. But not until November. I just November. 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 No, I don't have that. No, right. The yeah. senior center will be open, so that's good. Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yes. Okay. Is there a motion or do we want to table this to next month? Okay. Motion to um, to stick with the current pattern of going back to school the day after New Year's. Perfect. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we have a calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you mind adding in their graduation? Uh, yes, I made a note of that. Okay, that I will. Another thing people like to plan for. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that is a definitive that won't change based on snow days, is what you just said. So that's no, so it is. So they can plan that now. Nice. That's fine. Um, and so we're going to say that the school committee is in draft A, set the graduation date, because technically we are supposed to vote on that, which I just discovered last year. Remember? Oh, this yeah. year oh, yeah. I just discovered <laughs> that. And you're going to evaluate me. Uh, graduation date, 529. That's going to be such a great week because it's Memorial Day week. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want graduation day. Oh, so, okay. I, we don't want it the Friday before Memorial Day, it's but I did that. No, it's the Friday, Friday after. after. Right. Yeah, which means families can come visit and right. stay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good deal. All right. School choice. You have slots recommended. Uh, so what you are voting on, you have to vote annually to participate. We already have applications for next year. And then you have to start by voting on slots. We can always revisit these, right? 
Um, but we have to, in case we have more applications and we have spaces available. So what you, uh, your current grade, um, so you see your enrollment as of February 1st, the grade, the estimated enrollment for the next year, which we're assuming the cohorts are just staying the same, that could change, but we're moving every cohort up. Uh, and then you can see the slots available um, and where that puts the new total for the grade. We just divided the grades by two or three, depending for rough class estimates. Uh, so this is this was given to each of the principals, and they went over their numbers and made recommendations. They spoke with their teachers and made some recommendations for school choice slots. I just had uh, two questions. Sure. One is if you could talk about why grade three is at zero when other comparable sizes classes have slots available and the other question is about grade nine whether we we have historically seen a pretty large drop off it seems like of kids choicing out in grade nine whether we should you know basically approve more slots yeah so that so i'm going to work backwards that grade nine is a is a really is a good point I mean, we could certainly say, um, we could certainly, like 47 going yeah. from grade eight into grade nine, and yeah. I think you, you've applied a right. percent in the past where we've seen it just, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, go, they right. go to other schools, so. Right. And well, historically, what if we had open for seats for grade nine, and have we filled all the choice seats for that? No, so we've never filled all the choice seats. So, is years. it something that I feel like in, both, in the past, can we approve on a case by case basis too, if needed? Like, if we don't open up more, and you can't approve case by case. So, what you would do is you could decide that. So, we've had this has happened since you all have been here. So, yeah. we've had additional seats. Right. We've come back. What you've decided right. is to open up additional seats. Right. So, which may be what you're asking me, but I it just is. want to be clear for the public that the school committee does not review individual school choice applications ever. It's an entirely blind, blind lottery process, and Correct. we just increase the number of seats. So, yes, you can. I can always come back and say, we think we have more room in this grade. But to your point, I mean, we certainly can make that adjustment now in grade nine. Uh, we don't have, at this point in time, the same high number of students who pulled applications for Smith Vocational at this point. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, we're happy. I mean, our goal is to keep them here. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I was thinking about yeah. that. But historically, you know, you're right. Mm -hmm. And then you ask, um, so the teachers weigh in, and usually if they're saying, we, we don't want to open this grade for choice, it means that they've looked at the composition of student needs in that grade, and they have determined that based on the learning, behavioral, social, emotional needs of those students right now that they they are they don't recommend accepting choice at that point for that grade. So it could be sometimes a particular grade, although the numbers are small, the needs are great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think they're particularly sensitive to that too going into three because <coughs> three is a huge, huge, huge and difficult transition year for students. Yeah. A lot more academic. It's just a game changer. I hope no second graders are watching this. <laughs> <laughs> You'll survive it, man. It gets better after. Definitely. In my six years, I've seen that. that yeah. It, it's a real corner. It is. It is. Turn. It's it's very. It's just a whole different set of academic demands. It's, it's the first M cashier. It's, mm. it's a whole different year. I have a question about the the um, rising sixth graders. That was the one that last year we opened up to have. Um, some slots mm -hmm. rather than no slots whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Does this represent holding fast at that same level or, or is this a representation that we're increasing? So this carries it forward 47 in sixth staying in, in the seventh. But are you asking, I'm asking I think you're asking about the current the, are you talking the fifth grade going into Current sixth grade? Fifth going into sixth. Okay, I'm that sorry. That was the I grade said, that we yes. held fast, and then last year we said, okay, fine, we'll just add a couple. Now that we have three, three um, rooms, and I want to know: Are we holding fast to last year's level, or is this a proposal to increase? Looks like we're going to be. So, I yeah, I don't know. Three. 
classes? I don't know, and, and I should know that, but I don't. But I would even invite you folks, if you look at that number per, per classroom, 17, 17, 18, I don't feel like that's a big jump from where we are currently. So maybe it is a slight I, I, I increase. Think, I feel like this is the, after, uh, this is the total plus what we voted to open. So I think it's the like status quo to what we, yeah. Trying to use two, right? Yeah. Last year? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at trying to get that to these numbers of 17, 17, and 18. <coughs> right. so it's I do feel extra. as though that class, and so again, the teachers weigh in on this. I'm sorry I can't answer your question directly because I can't keep track of the school choice. We do get students in mid-year we have in some of our upper grades, so it changes a lot. But, um, I, I do think that the teachers we have seen that that group has settled considerably from remember when parents came to mm -hmm. I think before you folks were on school committee when parents came when that group was in third the grade goes to yeah up on bedding. so yep. so if there is a slight increase there may be a slight increase but we've seen tremendous stabilization among that group I don't feel like the numbers are that much higher though it, it's like, like 16 17 yeah I just, oh no yeah that's that's yeah, that's that's, that's, that's where they're at yeah Do you want to add more to nine? Okay. I, I think you make a valid point. point. If you know, if you think that we're going to have drop off, which I think we will, yeah. I don't want there to be, but you know, assuming that there will be, I, I just up the number of spots. So this goes here. I went to set the wrong place. Uh, so yeah. So maybe we put drop that the estimated in level. Um, yeah. I mean, even if you put it at forty-five and put five, I, yeah. Yeah, if you open up five slots and we're not filling five slots historically and there's a consistent pattern of students leaving in grade nine, then it's not going to really harm to open up five slots versus three. I, I actually would suggest, I would just make it yeah. six because of what I said about some of the applications. Just oh, okay. using that as okay. a guide. I don't okay. think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll add, we'll make it six slots for ninth mm -hmm. grade and drop the enrollment down to mm -hmm. 44 estimated? Yep. Okay. So keeping it at 50, still mm -hmm. yeah. in the grade. Yeah. All right. Any <coughs> questions on this? Right, that All you right. do have to vote. Yep. Is there a motion? Move to um, increase the slots for school choice for the incoming grade nine to six. Oh, the whole, the whole thing. Ask, okay. Sorry, so like I said, participate move in to school participate choice. in school choice <laughs> and uh, adjust that. Ninth grade. <coughs> second. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We will participate in school choice. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. Doors are open. Okay, superintendent formative evaluation. Uh, this, uh, I hope, is pretty straightforward. So, goals are in the packet. I have provided you with an update on progress toward goals where there's been significant, which is highlighted in green, some progress highlighted in yellow, and why I assessed it that way. Um, and I don't think I had any, my gosh, I fell down on the job. I don't think I had any no progress when I looked <coughs> through this. I almost, I was concerned about a no progress on my uh, collaborating with the town and community groups to host a community fair, but we have submitted, Sir and I have submitted a grant. So I'm quite hopeful we'll get funded. That would very much involve our community, and it's a, it's a career fair grant. Um, so to put on a pretty involved career fair in the community, I think it was a strong application. So I moved that one from the red to the yellow. It's right. Right. I think that will go right into green by the end of the year. Uh, my question for you: Are do you have concerns? Are there things that you're worried about that you're saying that I, I need to see the ball move down the field a little more quickly or more? I personally think that a lot of these are extremely time consuming and very involved projects that to have made significant progress or met the, the goals already is, I mean, to have one that says some progress, that's a pretty extensive and collaborative task to take on. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we've talked to you about in previous um, evaluations have been, you know, um, enabling the, the administration and the staff to, you know, lead certain activities mm -hmm. and 
partner with you rather than having you feel like you have to carry something forward yourself. You've got a, a strong group of people that all want to support you and support these schools. And I think you've continued to bring to us examples of where, whether it's you know partnering with Sir Simmons on the, the grant for the, the career fair, that's exactly what you know I want to keep hearing, which is how they, you know, the staff and the administration can help support you in this community. So it's also I fostering that. leaders too, and allowing staff to learn and have guidance on how to improve and advance their leadership skills, and never know what path they may want to take in the future. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some uh, because you said that about the grants. So Mr. Burns and I submitted a curriculum, uh, history and social science curriculum evaluation and writing map that he would work with teachers across the district. And we got that, which is really amazing, given the fact that competitive priority was given to low-performing districts. So I told him when we applied, this has been fun, I'm probably not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed writing this with me. Um, and you know, there were 105 proposals submitted, and only 33 were funded. And, com and competitive, but we did get it, and we've also submitted in uh, Ms. Commission. I submitted an ELA grant. We have high hopes for that, since I had no hopes for the history grant. I now have high hopes for the career fair grant and the ELA grant. Great. So, okay, you really, I mean, I think technically by the law, um, you can vote something, but for me, you're not required to. I just need to know if there was anything that you have concerns about. That's my primary thing. Is there anything that you have concerns about in terms of overall performance, things that you would like to see addressed, or are you concerned about uh, critical work in the district that um, you would like my attention paid to it? I think we're seeing progress in your goals. I think you've had an open dialogue with us about the things that where they haven't maybe moved as forward mm -hmm. as quickly as you would have liked, why? I think there's some bigger, longer term things that have come around that we're now, you know, really starting to realize. I mean, start time is one of them. It, you know, we began that dialogue a while back. We mm -hmm. began the dialogue around building improvements a while back and um, relatively. And mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's encouraging to see it. So I can't say that personally, I feel like it, um, our committee is left, you know, hanging on anything or um, in the dark on anything. You've been very diligent about, you know, either informing us where something is being held up or the process that needs to take place that takes time. So I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Keep it up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Your personnel report, there's a couple of resignations and then new hires, replacements, mostly in educational support professionals. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet on that front. So just a question, because yeah. um, we talked about history, chemistry, mm -hmm. bio, are those positions that are expected to be posted or is that kind of a future? So we will post uh, anticipated opening for the next school year. Yeah. People understand that those, and the, the hiring times are right, probably we'll start that in March. Um, March, early April is when we'll look to post teaching positions. Okay. So very soon, it'll say anticipated until the budget is approved. It's, <coughs> we may just post them as openings right now, but technically, you can't post for a position that you haven't funded. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Uh, but that's common across districts. Right, they do the same thing in the spring. Yeah, yeah, it's and very common. Maybe, you know, again, like the early bird might catch the worm in yeah. the instance of um, getting it out there in the hands of people who are looking to make a change. Absolutely. And yeah. people expect that and they know. And then when they come in and talk to us, we can say, look, our budget is, has always been funded. Right. Yeah. Nobody, the town has never voted down the school department budget. So right. we're pretty confident that this will work out. Of course. Okay, public comment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Our public has left. <laughs> Chris, business manager report. Okay, so first of all, is everyone comfortable with the temperature in here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Even I'm cold, <laughs> and that doesn't oh, happen. <laughs> I got a text from Are you Jeff. You paying the heating bill? <laughs> Jeff was watching the meeting, and he said, "There's nobody wearing hats, so I'm going to turn the heat down for the next." Meeting. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention the word kind of blanket. So I know. <laughs> So anyway, uh, the first 
item we have up is the um, the expense report. Not really. <laughs> yeah, not, not really. A well, since you said that, I know. I've been like <laughs> we're underneath, like still taking off my coat. Um, again, not really a heck of a lot here um, in terms of excitement. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told often that dull is a good thing when you're um, presenting the expense report. So mm -hmm. I guess you're looking at uh, a pretty good thing here. Um, you know, there's ups and downs throughout the accounts. Remember that we haven't yet uh, done any transfers to school choice, so we have you know another 675,000. Um, of expenses to transfer there and we have oh probably another two hundred thousand dollars or so maybe closer to three of uh, expense transfers to grants yet as well so um, you know when you're looking at the two million dollars we have to get us through the end of the year it's really closer to three um, and that's a very good position to be in at this point in time I mean that the year is you know certainly more than halfway over and you know, for items like supplies and, and things like that, you know, we, we buy a lot of those in the summer. The other thing is that we also have a lot of um, money that's encumbered, so there's, you know, items like the heating fuel, we encumber for that amount right at the beginning of the year, so that's kind of considered to be spent, even though it really hasn't been spent yet. And we can't feel it. Um, in and, 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 and apparently <laughs> won't be spent because we're not using any of it. It's not being spent at all. <laughs> You're saving money. Yes, Jeff, uh, He's, he's pretty diligent at um, shutting down the heat if there's not going to be anybody in the building and or if there's going to be a school committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I don't know if you have any questions on this, but really, uh, you know, again, as you know, if I'm getting nervous, I'll certainly tell you that. I'm, I'm not nervous at this point in time at all. No questions here. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, the next item we have is the grant report. Um, some grants have been fully expended. The, the 140 uh, Title IIA grant is all used up, as is the 262 grant for um, pre-K um, special ed. And there was one other one, I thought. Yes, the, the 391. Mm -hmm. The 391 is the preschool grant. Uh, we use that to offset um, some of the preschool director's salary. At one point in time, that would actually offset her entire salary, but they've been phasing this one out. And that was the mystery grant that we were told this was the last year of the mystery grant. And then Lauren applied for it. And they also were questioning it in another one of my districts. And nobody knew, are we getting this? Are we not getting this? We thought it was the last year. So nobody's complaining. Um, and maybe that's a trick. They tell you the money's <laughs> over, you just apply, and then they think, oh, maybe they forgot to tell them. <laughs> So, um, you know, we've, we've used all of that for this year, but, you know, it is a, a fortunate situation that we will be getting it at least one more year, so that's, that's good news. Um, but, you know, as you can see, it says amount remaining is 433000 but that's if we used all of the circuit breaker. We really don't want to do that. Um, so it's really dropping it more down towards the $300,000 uh, 300, level. Um, but still, you know, that's, that's a decent amount uh, to have in the grants. And at the same time, we're chipping away at using them. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to present the next page. Um, you will see actually a sizable increase in the, or I guess decrease, depending on the way you look at it, in the lunch account um, from November to December. I actually, you know, because if you look at October, November, we actually made a little bit of a, of a gain. And then to have this big drop in December, I wondered what could have caused such a drop you know, from one month to the next. We had a payroll on December 1st, so that was not reflected in the November, um, but it was $5,000-ish. Um, and so, you know, that hit us on December 1st, and then, of course, we had, I think we had three payrolls in the month of December. So um, it's, it's just one of those timing things, really, that... Uh, we had a big decrease at that point in time. I believe at this point there are about $3,500 to $4,000 in negative uh, balances for lunch accounts. Uh, again, you know, this is this is something that Diane grapples with on an annual basis, and 
quite honestly, really kind of ramps it up toward May and June when the school year is ending, and it continues right up until, you know, into July of uh, recovering some of those funds. Just a silly question, but are, are we positive that the, the POS system, school box or whatever it's called, it is in fact like working correctly? <laughs> I mean, it just seems... Uh, just, just that's, to a, that's a tough sure. one. I mean, we, you know, we, we're getting all of the deposits in yeah. from them because I, I am seeing that. Um, you mean in terms of is it ringing up a correct order or is it? In terms of getting the collection, like if, they, if I'm paying with a credit card and putting 40 bucks on my son's account, mm -hmm. is that actually flowing through to you? You know, in terms of? It is. I mean, I can ask Diane to just kind of take a quick look and make sure that it's for lack of a better term, registering everything correctly. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, kind of at the POS terminal. Where, yeah, that's all. Oh, you know, that, um, the other thing that you might want to do is look at different models. Are there other lunch purchase systems that uh, when a child spends $3 on their meal, it comes right off the account, like it would a debit card, rather than having to wait for a parent to add 20 or $40? I think that's how this works. Is no, the, the current system works in the in the way in which the parent has to refund an empty account. Right. You, right. You, instead of just being charged again, it's like easy pass. Is right. What right. Thinking. Exactly. Could it work with easy cards? Correct. Right. So there's. I, I bet there are other models and other school lunch systems which might. Help yeah, there definitely are. Um, yeah, That's we a good question. Look into that as well, sure. Because for some, that would help a great deal. Yeah. A big part of those charges. I mean, there are folks who face actual financial hardship, but sometimes, to your point, just like as you And this is a conversation with their child of, you know, you're not getting school lunch because we don't have money. I mean, it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Right. It's a more direct, um, <coughs> we're not right. serving as an intermediary, mm -hmm. um, floating a tap. Well, and there's a service charge every time you re up. On the school books. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, it makes it more compelling to, you know, load up more so that you don't have to keep doing it. But that's not something that, and, you know, everybody can do. Or someone avoids it. Yeah. Because or they don't ramp it at all. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another, you know, maybe there is another model where they're not charging that yep. transaction fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody's going to, it's, somebody's going to end up paying for it. Somebody's someone's going to end up paying for it, but there are other business yeah. models. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just don't know what the other options are. Yeah, and we haven't looked in a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, we haven't looked since we bought this. Right. One, so yeah, sure. that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything else on the revolving accounts, Chris? No. Um, other than to tell you that if I ever win the lottery big, <laughs> I'm going to donate to the lunch account just so I can <laughs> in your face. <laughs> The superintendent to have a positive balance. We would appreciate balance. that. <laughs> Please win the lottery. Right? <laughs> I just got positive marks for being a good team player in your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, school committee reports and discussion. So policy group, we're meeting tomorrow. We are. Yeah, finally, for you're real. Right. 12 hours from Seen now. Seen the size of that packet? packet? Oh, oh, my gosh. gosh. I have yeah. not got it yet. I'll do that today. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I guess that means that you guys will probably have first read then in March on a mm -hmm. bunch of policies. So mm -hmm. look forward to that. Um, Finance Tri Board, you already updated yep. us on that. Capital and Fields, we talked about we're doing mm -hmm. um, session on that. Uh, CES, anything on the collaborative? Uh, I shared with you at the beginning of February an annual report. We had some great data about their progress this last year. And just for uh, viewer interest, there's 36 member school districts, uh, 5,600 educators served through professional development that CES provides, um, 1,800 youth served, um, and, and lots of other data. Um, uh, it's a high-functioning organization. Yeah. They do a lot, and uh, they continue to do more um, this coming year. You know, you mentioned the the grant that you're applying for on the career fair. Mm -hmm. if, if by any chance that doesn't come through, does the collaborative have services to? They do. We already work with them. They actually do. They have a lot of 
uh, workforce development. And we do get some funding through them currently, mm -hmm. and they do assist us with uh, career and uh, school to career. Okay. And they are so responsive. Mm -hmm. So if we had an idea, and Annie yeah. often does, um, she has a direct dial to Bill and, yeah. and sits on a team of yeah. other superintendents with Bill to say, here are our shared needs, can yeah. you put together a package? And so, yeah, just about anything that we can imagine, you know, wanting to share, um, they can put together for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. okay, there's um, one more Schools Committee thing. Uh, yeah. I almost forgot. Designating a liaison for uh, driver negotiations assuming that that continues. Yeah. So it can be one person. You don't need to have two people. I don't think I'm saying because you've been done this before and they're very mm -hmm. small negotiations. I can't remember who did it last time. I think I, it was you and was it Tara? No. Bus? It just, bus? Uh, I feel like I did that with um, Joy. Yes. 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 yes, 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 that was me. Okay. Um, so we need a single, um, uh, so we have to pursue all avenues simultaneously. So we need at least one person designated. And I'm going to go back to it. It should be one person um, designated because then we won't run into the issues by about a quorum. Right. Uh, so um, is there yeah. a volunteer to head up the bus negotiation? I wish I could. I, I, you know how much I love doing negotiations in general. Um, but I have a lot of travel coming up, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do my best to make these school committee meetings themselves. Mm -hmm. Do we know when they are? I don't mind. So we have done them in the past in the morning, but at the school committee's work schedule that we would work around um, the school committee. So there's time during the day where they have a, a break. They were pretty contained during the day because it was between their two runs. So they were short meetings. It did wrap up pretty quickly, and it was the first contract. So honestly, I don't perceive it being terribly involved but we would respect the schedule it's when when everybody's available the committee that's my only concern is that I, I I don't know how much I'd be able to skip out in the middle of the day yeah, or no, in the morning uh, absolutely but I would have to do that and if we can quickly wrap up yeah I don't know when will this start up so once uh, we've designated somebody then I will reach out including that school committee member the uh, Fred Dupre attorneys on both sides and, mm -hmm. Within, it's really the attorney schedule. So I can't, in terms of start, it depends when the attorneys are available, which is. But it's an immediate yeah. negotiation. Okay. What do you think? You should assign Paul for this. Right. <laughs> well, he's got the middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> um, why don't you put me down? Um, put you down? Yep. Okay. Unless anyone else wants to volunteer. Did you want to, Tara? Um, I don't mind doing it. It's just that I think I'm, my schedule is probably going to be more limited okay. for the day. Okay. Perfect. <coughs> All right. All right. Okay. Um, let's go through. We did the mm -hmm. service field trip. We approved the music, dates, uh, program studies. We talked about walking around. Mm -hmm. All right. So we need a, um, a motion for the approval of the AP warrants that were submitted in January 2019. Motion to approve the AP warrant submitted in January of 2019. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All abstain? Mm -hmm. Approval of the January 14, 2019 minutes. Any comments or um, revisions to that? Okay, is there a motion? <coughs> motion to approve the January 14, 2019 minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approval of the warrants submitted in January 2019. Is there a motion? Move to approve the warrants submitted in January 2019. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And we did the calendar. Mm -hmm. We did the school choice slots and we are participating in school choice. We did the SOI vote. That was fun to read. And we um, talked about informative evaluation rating. We did not vote on that. Uh, is, do we need no okay. All right. It, it, as long as you're not going to fire me, it's really it's fine. It's <laughs> no intent to fire you. Okay. Um, the next regular meeting before we go into executive session, uh, March 25th, I am not going to be here. Um, I was going to originally say, please convene without me, but I really do want to be here for the forum. You know, uh, on the school start time. 
I don't know whether the prior week, um, the 18th, um, it sounded like maybe Tuesday night. This That's Monday was. What does the following the couple of days look like for you? After the 25th, like the 26th, the 27th? I'm gone that whole week. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Another possibility is April 1st. Putting it off there? Um, that is candidates' night here from the Mother's Club. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could meet, but I would hate to have a forum the same night that they're doing. So you might pull out people. Like, if we start, what time does the forum? 7 p.m. At 7 p.m., so we would meet in a different room. But to that point, potentially, and you know, we'll after you guys for candidate time, what I have on the agenda for March will be an update on the budget. There won't be a final budget to vote. The busing forum policy and whether or not we have a locker room or not. If we've got any information on the locker room, mm -hmm. that's it. I think that's it. We can't make it first. We can't make it. Okay. Sorry. So you want to go back to that previous week then? Do you want to look at April 2nd, the previous week? We can also patch in for more of Ryan, if you allow. Paul's going to be patching in any days. Um, Could, but then the three other folks have to be here. Yeah. Right. The, the, the remote folks don't count unless there's a form. The, the, week, the week of the first, is there any other day? Um, would the second yes, work? Yes, the second works. How does that look for you guys? Yeah, the whole week. Right now, the second is open for you. can do the second. As of, I, I, yes, I believe that works. Yes, I can do it. Okay, right. so we will hold our March meeting really in April on the 2nd. And let me just ask, our regular April meeting is supposed to be, is it the 22nd? Um, let me make sure this just to make sure this works. It's not during April break. So then one, two, three, four, the 22nd. Okay. Yeah. And is that enough time in between for like first so. read and final reads, things like that? I think so. Okay, so April 2nd, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. And then our April meeting will also be the 22nd. Mm -hmm. So possible I'll be having just a few minutes of The 22nd, I'm just. The 22nd is our, our regular April meeting. So what will be important in April, and it's okay if we end up changing the 22nd, but right now it looks like who can make it on the 22nd? I can. Heather can. I can. Terry can. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually I can't. I'm sorry. So let's try to pick April now. You know why? Because that's when you do public hearing on the budget. And if that doesn't yeah. get in the paper and voted, we can't vote it on town meeting before. Mm -hmm. Any chance that the 30th might work for you? April 30th, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. okay. Currently, that looks fine. Me too. Okay. So, in lieu of the 22nd, we're looking at April 30th, which would also then be that would be the public hearing of the budget. Great. Okay. So, April 2nd is our rescheduled March date, 5:30. Uh, we'll do the forum then mm -hmm. and other topics, and then April 30th will be our April meeting. Yeah. Open, sorry, budget open, open here. Can you do that? Yeah. Does that work for you? Way in there. I'll just fill you in the week before. Yeah, right. just done. And you know me, I'll just say, I don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, I'll take that too. I mean, if you Great, talk to him via you. email too, but I'll, I'll make sure. Um, I, I know May is a ways out, but the fourth Monday is Memorial Day. So does it make sense to try to plant a flag on the 20th? <clears throat> So it, that is unfortunately hard for me to say right now because I have on here hold for grant conference. I don't know if that's a mandatory grant conference, so I'm not sure. Or the 29th and 28th? 28th or 29th would be better for me. Yeah, maybe the 28th. Because I know I won't have any work track. Three Tuesdays in a row we could do the 
the Tuesday, yeah. Does the 28th? The 28th works for May. Work? Yeah, works for me. Okay. Is it, can you put a tentative hold in there? Is it too much, or does, do things happen too much for you? Is it possible for us to make that May decision at that March meeting that is now April? Is that okay? I just, yeah, I, I have, unfortunately, all these holds mm. for possible grant conference, possible meeting. Yeah. Can we pick a date that doesn't have a hold for you? Just even yeah. if it's tentative, otherwise my, our schedules get, get, get filled up so quickly. Yeah. All right, so then I would, so um, we could look at the 21st, ask you. 29th, yeah, is the 29th, is the 29th yeah. a possibility yeah. for people? Yes. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so can we say that as a, as a okay. So yeah. I will miss the CES board meeting, but that's, you know, that this takes precedence, I think. Okay. Okay, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. No problem. So that's the 29th, I said. Yep. All right. We just need to adjourn and go into executive session. Okay, and I know the statement that needs to be read is on the agenda. And you know what? You as the chair can read. I will entertain a motion too, and then somebody all I have to do is say so. Got it. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to contract negotiations with non-union personnel and to discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property, as I have determined that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body, and not to return to open session. I'll make that motion so that you can entertain it. <laughs> <laughs> I am entertained. I will sign it. All right, and a roll call vote. Keith. <laughs> Keith, are you entertained? I'm quite entertained, yes. and yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Tara. Yes. Mara. Uh, <laughs> I vote yes. Great. We go into okay. exact session. Okay.